Uh, good morning, colleagues, friends, students. Um, I should like to share some thoughts with you about learning scales in the easiest order. Or, in other words, to teach your students from a beginner's level the scales in the easiest and best learning order. Um, I think you will all agree that many players have a mental block about scales and arpeggios. Um, there's normally a very good reason for uh, this mental block. I think, and I think um, I'm not saying anything that you don't know yourself, um, that very often happens because all of a sudden at some stage in the student's career, a lot of scales are dumped on them in preparation for some external exam or subject exam. So all of a sudden they have to learn this lot of scales and arpeggios and there's no rhyme or reason or system uh, in the set of scales that they are given. And it becomes, it could easily become a struggle. And that is one of the ways how this mental block develops uh, because they eventually walk into the exam room and perhaps know that they don't know their, their scale so well. And of course, then they also don't do so well. So they also come to the conclusion, well, you know, I'm useless at scales or I'm not good at scales. There's actually, I think, I believe, and I think you also know that there's a very simple underlying principle regarding how you learn scales. Also, the best way to avoid any mental block being formed in any of your students, it is very important to introduce scales even at a beginner's level, at a pre-grade one level. Now, the principle is not the tonality. In other words, starting with C major and then perhaps add more and more sharps, G major, D major, etc. Or adding more and more flats, F major, B flat major, E flat major. You will agree, and I think you all know that the underlying principle is the finger frames or finger formations that are involved. And of course, by that I mean the position of each finger uh, in reference to the other finger. Uh, in other words, whether the fingers form semitones or whole tones between them. Now, you know that from a physiological point of view, this is the easiest position where the two middle fingers are next to each other, because that physiologically, one can almost say that they are webbed. By nature, they are close together. If one has a totally relaxed hand, you will never have the, these two fingers apart. So this is called the first finger frame, which was Alan Solomon's term. Uh, you could also say finger formation, or you can have uh, a finger raamwerk, finger formatie. Uh, but from a beginner's point of view, this is obviously the finger position, which you must start with when you, when you teach scales and arpeggios to a pupil. Dwarf line, you know, whose methods are very, very good and very thorough, he says this means the finger frame which has the open string as do or as the tonic. And that's quite right. If you use this finger frame, that means you play a scale starting on an open string. Now, in, if that's the case, it means that the first three scales that you could teach your student would be D major, A major, and G major, all three starting on the open strings. Obviously, you can't have E major because you wouldn't be able to play the, first, the second half of the octave uh, in first position. On the same point, there is now a question. If those three scales, G, D and A, each starting on the open string, uh, are the first scales to teach, okay, which of these three would you then teach first? Now here, the answers digress. I think you will all agree that one wouldn't start on the G. So one wouldn't start with G major because that uh, uh, involves a slightly awkward and higher position of the elbow, which is not as easy and as natural as the other two scales. If you are a, a Suzuki teacher uh, or a follower of Suzuki, then the obvious choice would be to start with A major. Why do I say that? We know that uh, Suzuki 
players start playing on the E string first. That's the very first string that they play on. Um, now, why do Suzuki players start on the E string? There is a very good explanation for that. Bearing in mind that you have a beginner playing, by playing on the E string, your bow is almost vertical, which means there's almost no pressure on the pinky. Uh, uh, the more vertical you hold your bow, the less pressure and, and uh, tension, tension there would be in the fingers. One, one is able to actually hold the bow vertically, and it's only the friction between the fingers and the bow that, that is necessary to hold your bow in position. So the reason why Suzuki players do E string first is simply because that affords least pressure on the pinky, especially. So I can take my pinky away here, whereas I, I cannot really uh, easily, especially if, uh, if, it's, if I'm a beginner, it's not so easy to take the, the pinky away when you play with the, via, uh, the bow on a more horizontal level. Okay, so to get back, A major would then be the first uh, scale that Suzuki followers would do. I prefer to start on the D string with D major. I feel the two middle strings uh, to me are the, uh, the golden mean. But I don't think one can prescribe and say the one is better than the other, as long as one doesn't start with uh, G major, I think. Okay, now on this point there are several other things that one uh, could address. Supposing you started with D major as the very first scale that you introduced to your student. The question is now, are you going to start with short bowings in the middle? Or are you going to start with sets of long bows? Uh, which is the best? The answer is yes. I think one must be able to do both. Um, obviously, the advantage of the short bowing strokes, let's say, uh, according to one of the Suzuki variations, enables the pupil to play, uh, uh, to exert, um, I don't want to say pressure, but to have good contact with the string, to rub the bow into the string. On the other hand, you also want to develop the generous full bow bowing from the beginning. So I would do, I've always used to do the two together. So that's the first thing. On the same point, when one does the short bow strokes, what I've often found or seen uh, with my beginners, beginner pupils, when I still had beginners many years ago, was a spontaneous flexibility in the fingers. That was, that sometimes happened spontaneously before I even explained the question of finger flexibility, etc., etc., to them. If you have a beginner pupil and you see this happening spontaneously, it is a very gratifying experience because then at least you can tell yourself, I've done something right. I'm on the right track. The, uh, obviously, the pupil's bow hold must be correct uh, for, for this to happen spontaneously. Um, so what I'm trying to say is that the short bow strokes in the middle uh, is an easy way uh, to almost spontaneously develop finger flexibility. Okay, there are many other things that still also come into play when you teach this very first scale, be it D major or A major, to a pupil. I always encourage the pupils to keep their fingers down on the previous string when they go to the next string. In other words, I'll do it quickly. Now a few things, I'll come back to the string crossing. I ask them to keep their fingers down while they start playing on the next string. Now, first of all, this is simply good because it, it improves the finger formation and it settles the left, sorry, not the finger formation, the left hand formation. Um, so that's a way to get it settled. Uh, but the other thing is also that it's a very good way to ensure that the elbow is not too far to the left. If the elbow is too far to the left, that will mean that the fingers are actually skew on the string. You will see the more you pull your elbow to the left, the more uh, skew or topple the fingers become. And this is what will happen if your elbow is not far enough to the right. The fingers will then interfere with the A string, causing this awful sound. So, 
this is a very uh, non-invasive way of getting a pupil to hold the elbow far enough to the right and also also to, uh, to keep the fingers upright. So that's the first thing. Try to encourage them to keep their fingers down when they've already started playing the A string. The idea is to keep each finger down until it's needed on the next string. In other words, only the first finger across, only the second finger across, and then the third finger. That might be asking too much uh, from some students. In that case, dispense with having, you know, letting them keep all the fingers down, but at least let them still keep their fingers down until they've started playing on the open A string. And now they can take it away. The other thing is, of course, it's very important from the outset to encourage the elbow falling action. Remember, you, you don't play, but the elbow must drop. So this string crossing must be done in steps. In other words, stop, drop the elbow, play. So, uh, even though it's a very simple scale, and the, and the student will also find it very easy, it still involves a lot of technique and a lot of detail, which is your responsibility as, as teacher to enforce or to supervise or to instill into the pupil. Okay. Um, the next question is, when does one start introducing the fourth finger? Okay, now I personally feel very strongly that you never use the fourth finger going up. Uh, I've seen too many times that when one tries to do that, fourth thing and now the first thing that the pupils find that hard and they contrive their left wrist. They make it skew, they, they twist the wrist. It's simply an awkward transition from fourth thing on the lower string to first thing on the next string. So my rule of thumb is, after they've played open strings going up and down, they will eventually use the fourth thing coming down. So, now again, stop, and now build up, while you keep your first finger down on the A string, build up second, third, and fourth finger on the D string, and then play. So I'll repeat. When you return, let the pupil stop and keep the first finger down on A. That's the point of reference, and the anchor, as it were. And then build up the fingers in the correct uh, finger frame position on the D string. Okay. Um, another matter of detail, which is also still very, very important, make the pupil aware of resonance from the very outset. By that, I simply mean creating the overtones by playing exactly in tune. Sometimes people say, you know, you've, you've got a lovely violin, it must be a very expensive violin. And then it's not the violin that's so expensive, but simply the pupil that plays so well in tune that all the open strings that could possibly resonate do resonate. So that is also something that you must make the pupil aware of from the very outset. Kids find it absolutely fascinating when you play first thing on the G string, and you show them how the A and the E string vibrate in sympathy, the first and second overtones. And of course, it's also something that's not only visible, but also audible. You can also dom demonstrate the opposite by either pl uh, playing the A out of tune, too sharp or too low, in which case you also wouldn't get the resonance, or by playing the A in tune, but damping the A and the E strings. Then you also have a dead and dull sound. I don't know if it would be audible on the video, uh, but um, that is actually what happens and you can test it yourself. Now, kids find that fascinating. You know, you can tell them it's a ghost playing on the other strings or a fairy or whatever. But once they've witnessed this, they strive very valiantly to always create these vibrations of the strings wherever. So, for example, when you play D major, you would have the E string answering in sympathy when you play the first string E. And then also when you play the G, 
you will have the G string vibrating in two parts, which is something that's visible and also audible, because if you damp the G string, the sound is dead. Not damped. Of course, the same thing applies to the D, the top D. Here you have the D string vibrating in two halves and the G string vibrating in three thirds. So again, and when I damp the strings, it's totally dead. So that's the third component that you could introduce from the very outset. Uh, I wanted to say much more, but I think this is uh, uh, long enough of a lecture. I've only done the three very first scales that you do based on the first finger frame. All I can say is that the next set of strings, uh, set of scales that you would do would be the scales which have the tonic on the third finger. So those are two possible scales. When you have the tonic on the third finger, that means you will have the first and the second finger next to each other. And the two scales that, that could be done would then be C major, starting with the third finger on the D string, G string, or, and G major, starting with the third finger on the D string. Okay. Now, of course, in applying all these other principles, the string crossing, keeping the fingers down, uh, striving for resonance. Now, at this point, and this is the last thing I want to say, if you've now done the three scales based on the first finger formation, G, D, and A, and you've done the two scales based on the second finger frame, namely C and G, starting on the third finger, then there's one obvious scale that you now can do without having to teach anything extra. Putting the two octaves of G together. And this is now the point I want to make. If you've done these two sets of scales with a pupil, the three one octave scales starting on the open strings and the two one octave scales starting on the third finger, then you can tell the pupil, okay, now I want you to play G two octaves. Hopefully they will know what two octaves means. Now, the reaction of most students is, no, no but I've never done it. I, I, I've, I've never practiced. I, I don't know how. Insist and tell the pupil you can play it. Play it. Nine times out of ten, they play it correctly and spontaneously correctly the first time. They, they experience a wonderful sense of achievement. And their self-confidence gets a wonderful boost because you can make a big fuss. You can say, wow, but you're good at scales. Look there, you didn't even practice and you played G major perfectly, two octaves. What is the psychological result? Unconsciously, besides the fact that the pupil gathers in self-confidence and uh, experiences a sense of achievement, the unconsciously the pupil also starts thinking, oh, but scales are easy. And when they think scales are easy, that preconceived idea will also be self-fulfilling. Just as, on the opposite side, if you approach scales with the preconceived idea that scales are hard and that I, that I struggle at scales, I'm not good at scales, that expectation will also be self-fulfilling. So you can use these simple beginner scales, which a pre-grade one pupil can do, to already start boosting the pupil's confidence and giving them a mindset that scales are easy and that I can master it easily because I'm good at scales. Thank you.